Hello, this is the third uh, sec lecture on Taylor series on section 11.10. You can tell it's a big deal because we've never done three before. Last time I explained to you Taylor's inequality. I'm going to remind you and then give you some uh, examples of it. So Taylor's inequality allows you to estimate the error when you approximate a function by its nth Taylor polynomial. Remember, its nth Taylor polynomial is the usual um, Taylor series, except we stop at the degree n term. Okay, and we don't do anything else. So that's a simple polynomial. We hope that it does a good job of approximating f of x. Taylor's inequality tells you how good a job it does. So the error, the absolute value of the difference between the actual and the approximated is bounded by some number divided by n plus 1 factorial over x minus a to the n plus 1. That is exactly the form of the next term um, if you put f n plus 1th derivative at a in for m, you'd be getting exactly the next term. So this error term looks a lot like the next term. But instead of being the nth derivative at a of f, it is the biggest that the nth derivative gets in absolute value. Don't forget these. Between x and a. Okay, So you can't just look at the nth derivative at a to get the error term. You have to look at it near to a. Okay, how do we use this? So we'll start with kind of the, the baseline example for all of this, e to the x. Taylor series converges everywhere. It's really easy to work with. It's universally important. Um, so one, the first thing that Taylor's inequality gets you is it tells you that thing that I've just been assuring you that the Taylor polynomial, the Taylor series converges to the function where it defined. So for example, for e to the x, here's the Taylor series for e to the x, the Maclaurin series, because we're going to focus on a equals 0. And we already figured out what all the nth derivatives of e to the x are. It's really easy. They're all e to the x. So that thing that we use to compute m, the n plus first derivative, is very simple. It's e to the x. We want the biggest e to the x can be, or e to the y, I should say, um, if y is between 0 and x. So if x is positive, that's saying y is in the interval from 0 to x. That's easy. e to the x is positive, so we don't care about these absolute values, and it's increasing. So the biggest it gets, right, this is, e, this is what e to the x looks like. The biggest it gets is the rightmost endpoint. So if x is positive, the biggest e to the y can be on that interval is e to the x. If x is negative, the biggest it can be is the right endpoint, which is e to the 0 or 1. Okay? And if that max of those two values confuses you, don't worry about it. Just assume x is positive and put e to the x in there and try to understand it there. So Taylor's inequality tells you that the thing we want, minus our approximation, absolute value of the difference is bounded by this number. So whatever our e to the x is, or maybe 1, whichever is bigger, divided by n plus 1 factorial over um, absolute value. I don't know why, where the absolute values came from. Um, yeah, the absolute value should be in there. Uh, sorry, that was that's a confusing point that I, have, I will fix up in the notes. Um, the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 so that number is different for each x, but for any particular x, it's some number, okay? So as n goes to infinity, m, whatever that function of x is, times absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial is an exponential in n over a factorial. We know that goes to 0, okay? So that means that the error between f and sn goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. That is to say, 
that the Taylor series converges to e to the x. So that's how the argument will generally go. We, were, we relied heavily on the fact that we knew what we could find all the m's at once for all the different n's. So that made e to the x easier. For more complicated functions, it can be much harder. Um, OK, but more powerful than that is we can tell how fast it converges. So if we'd like to know what the number e is, a natural way to approximate it is with its Taylor polynomial, um, which looks like this. Right? This is just the Taylor polynomial up to 10 with x equals 1 plugged in. Plug in x equals 1. All you get is 1 plus 1 plus a half plus a 6 plus a fourth factorial plus a 1 over 5 factorial and so on. That is a pretty good approximation to e. How good? Taylor's inequality tells you. Um, if we want how good s10 is, we need to know what the 11th derivative of the function is. That's easy. It's e to the x, positive and increasing. So the biggest that the 11th derivative of f on that interval gets between 0 and 1 is the right endpoint, e to the 1. So once again, here's e to the x. We're going from a equals 0 to x equals 1. And the biggest value happens at e to the 1 or e. So that is all to say that the error between e and this approximation is less than or equal to, here's the usual Taylor's inequality. In our case, m is e, n is 10, so n plus 1 is 11. And um, x minus a is 1 minus 0. This should read 1 to the 11th, but it doesn't matter. It's just 1. And you type that into your calculator. You find that the error is 6.81. It's bounded by 6.81 times 10 to the negative 8th. So S10 is our approximation of E. E10 is our error. And remember, the nicest way to write an approximation along with an error bound is with what are called error bars the approximation plus or minus the error. Um, and that describes an interval 2.71828101 minus 6.81 times 10 to the negative eighth is this. The approximation plus the error bound is this. And that is a very narrow interval, right? The first place where these disagree is in the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh digit where they're off by one. So that's a very narrow window in which to find e. And in fact, if you type it into your calculator, it fits in that window. Um, so that's how you estimate the error of an approximation using a Taylor polynomial. Um, we can at least sometimes do even better than that. Um, what we really want when you type into your calculator, give me e, um, what it does is it's going to use a Taylor polynomial, but it has to decide how many digits to take it to. So how big n has to be. What it does is it looks at its screen, and if there are 10 digits, it says, I want to make sure that the first 10 digits are correct. So I want an error of 1 times 10 to the negative 11th, something like that. And then it figures out how big n has to be. So that's what I want to show you an example of. So suppose our acceptable error tolerance is point one, two, three, four zeros, and then a 1. And suppose, once again, we're trying to approximate e. So we need n to be big enough that the error is less than point oh 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 one which means since all the only control we have over the error is Taylor's inequality, is we need n to be big enough that this quantity in Taylor's inequality is less than that. So as before, m is the biggest e to the x gets between 0 and 1, regardless of what little n is. So big N, big M is e. So we get Taylor's inequality gives you e over n plus 1 factorial times 1 minus 0 to the 11th. Well, that's just 1. 
And if you look at this inequality, the only unknown is n, right? So you can solve for n that makes this true. How do you do that? Multiply both sides by n plus 1 factorial and divide both sides by 0. 0.00001. One more zero. And that gives you n plus 1 factorial has to be bigger than e over 0. 0.00001, which is 271,000 and change. So if you could invert factorial, you'd say n plus 1 has to be bigger than the inverse factorial of this number. I don't know how to do that, but I can just try some n's and see what happens. If I start in my calculator, or I did this in Excel, start with n equals 1, I and go up, compute all the n factorials, I find that 7 plus 1 factorial is 362,000 and change. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a mistake, sorry. Um, well, I wrote the numbers wrong. I will fix that in the, in, in the uh, notes, but I found that seven plus one factorial is a little bit smaller, seven and eight plus one factorial is a little bit bigger. So the first n that makes this inequality true is eight, okay? Remember, in the inequality game, if you're trying to make an inequality true, then you sometimes have to kind of overdo it. In some sense, the correct answer should be between 7 and 8, but of course you can't have an integer between 7 and 8. But 8 definitely is big enough. 8 and anything bigger will work. Um, and there's another typo, the desired accuracy. So to get that accuracy, you need to go out to S8. All right. Here's in one more example of this sort. Now let's look, work with sine of x. Say we want to approximate sine of 1 to an accuracy of 0 0.01, 0001. Let's figure out what n has to be. Let's figure out what sn is. Figure out what the error is. Write the whole thing in error bars. Okay? Here's how we do it. Um, all the derivatives of sine of x, whatever n is, is either sine or minus sine, or cosine, or minus cosine, right? They keep changing, but we don't really care, because all of those, no matter what x is, are between 1 and minus 1, okay? So the nth derivative of sine of x at x, no matter what n is, no matter what x is, its absolute value is less than or equal to 1, okay? So that means we can just use m equals 1. For the particular case we're doing, that might be too big. So what? If it's too big, then we'll, we'll use maybe a more, one more n than we needed to? No problem. Okay? And that's generally the philosophy of estimation. At various times, you want to bound things, you, you focus on the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario this maximum could be 1, and if it's less, no big deal. Um, so all of that is to say we use Taylor's inequality with m equals 1, and once again, x is 1, a is 0, because we're using the Maclaurin series, and I'm following the book in lowercasing l, although I had always seen it as uppercase l, so you, you, you do you, but I'm going to follow the book. So as always, we need the quantity in Taylor's inequality to be less than our acceptable error. You divide by 0. 0.0001 and you multiply by n plus 1 factorial. And we find we need n plus 1 factorial has to be bigger than 10,000. Same game, can invert it, but um, I find that the first place that that's true is when n equals 7 by just exploring it. When n equals 7, we get that the error is bounded by, not equal to, is bounded by the Taylor inequality, which is actually we get much less error than we expected, right? So if we had done n equals 6, this would be a little bit bigger than 0.0001, but in fact, with n equals 7, it's quite a bit smaller. 
So that means we need to take sine of x out to the order seven term. Really important point here. That doesn't mean there are seven terms. That means we go out to x minus a raised to the seventh power. That's not very many terms in sine of x because we only get the odd terms. It's x minus x cubed over six plus x to the fifth over 120 minus x to the seven over 50, 40. That's it. When I plug in one, I get 0.84147. So with error bars, that says the sine of one is 0.84147 plus or minus 0.000025. That's the interval I guess get. And my calculator, just to see if it's reasonable, falls happily inside that interval. Okay, last thing I wanna show you um, is a piece of notation. So just to repeat, um, what Taylor's inequality says is that f of x minus s of n absolute values, the error, is some function which we don't know, but we know is bounded by something times x minus a to the n plus 1. So in this case, it's m over n plus 1 factorial. I'm just going to absorb that all into k. Um, and it's hard to find m in many cases, um, but knowing, simply knowing there is something is often enough. So here's what we're going to do. Then we're going to say if the difference between two things, f of x and s of n, is absolute value bounded by a multiple of something like x minus a to the n plus 1, we will say that f of x is equal to sn plus big O of x minus a to the n plus 1. That is, a function bounded by some multiple of x minus a to the n plus 1. That's what that means. So Taylor's inequality can very simply be said that, written this way, that any function is equal to its Taylor poly polynomial plus big O of x minus a to the n plus 1. Um, why is that useful? So, or, or what does that look like? So here, as long as x is in some bounded interval, I know right away that e to the x is equal to 1 plus x plus order x squared. Okay? Order x squared is something that when x is small, is quite small. That's the idea of it. Um, so uh, that gives you some kind of control of how well 1 plus x approximates e to the x a little bit of a vague control because we don't we're not thinking about what that number is in this case we actually know if you go through what we did before the number is e over 2 but we don't care because often we'll need to address things like this what's the limit as x approaches 0 of e to the x minus 1 over x those of you in professor ryan's class may know i, I think you learned the um uh the um L'Hopital's rule as a way of doing this. This is a more powerful tool than L'Hopital's rule, um, although L'Hopital's rule is great. All you do, if you've got some, like if it were a polynomial, we learned how to do that in the beginning of the year. So make it a polynomial. e to the x is a polynomial like this, 1 plus x plus something times x squared. Okay? You substitute that in and subtract 1. You get x plus something times x squared divided by x. Well, x divided by x is 1. Something times x squared divided by x is something times x. Okay? And then what happens is x goes to 0. Whatever the something is, something times x goes to 0. So this just becomes 1. Okay? So this big O notation is going to allow us to address the limits as x approaches a. But in general, it's going to allow us to address the small x behavior, right? In the same way that our limits as x went to infinity, we could do a little bit better than just say what number it approached. We could say what function it behaved like. As x approaches infinity or n goes to infinity, the large x or large n behavior of complicated functions or complicated terms in a sum behaves like something very simple. A similar Taylor's, all of the Taylor series one of the most important things is that you can say the same about small x behavior or x near to an a. Near to a, e to the x behaves like 1 plus x 
So this limit is just going to be 1. Because if it were 1 plus x, that's what it would be. Okay, so that's a really powerful tool we're going to explore in the next section.